Welcome to the Coroner's Report, Episode 3 of Miss Maybelline, the Pied Piper, and a Clown Named Hobby. Before we begin, please remember this is a true crime podcast with adult themes. Please be aware, when possible, the actual person's voice is in this podcast. However, several witnesses are deceased, and some chose not to be recorded. Still others agreed for their words to be used, but not their real names. Please remember to like and follow us on all social media platforms, and please remember to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. All subjects or persons of interest mentioned within are considered innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. It's opening night of the Palace Dinner Theater. A capacity crowd has shown up. Evelyn Williams, Miss Maybelline, is decked out in a gorgeous black sequin pantsuit and beautiful black sequin cowgirl hat. She's waiting backstage for her big debut. Rick Warren, musical director and show producer, steps into the spotlight on the stage and the crowd cheers as Evelyn's favorite song, Love is a Many Splendored Thing begins to play. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, the queen of the palace. So she came on stage and she said, welcome everyone to my palace. And then she said, everyone have a great time. Welcome back to the Coroner's Report. My name is Steve Navojack. I'm a retired coroner of two of the largest counties in Arkansas, as well as being the former director of the state crime lab. I've been reviewing old cases, and along with my partners, Tracy Carrington and Carla Bozeman, this one has been a real gem. Sometimes these reviews turn up new details that will take your breath away. This is one of those cases. In the two prior episodes, we have been setting the stage and allowing you to get to know the wacky characters. We have followed Miss Maybelline, Evelyn Williams, an heiress to the Maybelline fortune through marriages, widowhood, and divorces. We introduced you to her ex-husband, Hobby Derrick, and provided insight on her friend and business partner, Danny King. The roller skating rink was evolving quickly into a dinner theater, and the stage was set, so to speak, for Evelyn's next adventure. But sadly, her life would be cut short within 24 hours of the grand opening of the Palace Dinner Theater. Your job as a faithful listener is to decide, was this simply a terrible accident, or was the Maybelline Queen the victim of foul play, and if so, who did it? After our second episode dropped, we heard from Danny King. Yes, he's still alive and in his 80s and living in California. We tried several times to interview him, but he refused. However, he did leave us a lengthy voice message on Facebook. Danny seemed concerned about the accuracy of our team's research. Tracy, uh, this is Danny King. I listen to your podcast on Spotify. I don't do those kind of apps or anything. At 81 years old, I have teams of people that monitor all that for me. But first, the voice you hired to sound like me sounds nothing like me, number one. But that's fine. We never had a Cadillac convertible, ever. We had an Eldorado Biarritz uh, hardtop. We never wore meat coats driving down Central. Evelyn had one clipped white mink and leather jackets. She didn't like uh, big mink coats. I had a uh, Lynx full-length jacket. I wore it in winter, and I still have it. Uh, I, when I go to Russia, I wear it because it's very warm. But that's all ridiculous. Uh, and she was never thin. You've got this bohunk using a fake voice for the coroner saying, she's thin as a rail. No, she wasn't thin. She had big boobs and she wore a corset. Well, I'm not going to split hairs over if it was a coat or a jacket or a minx or a lynx or a mohair. But it sure seems that Danny finds those details important. We do know from the police file there was a receipt from Binsky Furs for two lamb coats purchased less than three weeks before the fire. One was for a gray Persian lamb coat for $1,295, and the other for a muskrat sides coat for $950. Sadly, Evelyn didn't live long enough to pay off the balance due on those coats. The balance was paid for out of the estate following her death. You know, we like to focus more on evidence, but yes, This is Steve's real voice and his memories, his 46-year-old memories. But there were others, if you recall, that remember that full-length fur coat. Danny was accustomed. 
customer. He came in. He swirled in one night. He really did. He swirled in one night. He wore a different mink every time he came. And with no shirt. He didn't have a shirt on. And he, he would always come in. And he would sling his coat over to the... I used to have a coat check lounge. He'd sling it over to the girl and say, Watch this mink. Don't let anybody touch it. Meanwhile, back at the Maybelline Manor, the guys of the kids' rock band were practicing daily, and they were thrilled to have a free place to rehearse. Glenn Allen was the drummer and took his music seriously, but he really didn't take Danny King all that seriously. I wanted resources for the band. I just took advantage of his interest. That's it. Jay and I, and Joe, we didn't fraternize with Danny unless... He came in there and talked about doing a gig or whatever, and every time he walked down the room, we'd just laugh at the guy, you know? And I'm like, okay, you know what? The guy's a weirdo. He's a freak. We just didn't take the guy seriously. Danny's BS. Not everyone was happy at the Maybelline Manor. The house overlooking Lake Hamilton was a busy place with the rock band kids practicing every day in an extra room at the house. Tempers were hot. There was a lot riding on the success of the dinner theater. Even those that weren't close to Danny and Evelyn could feel the tension in the air. We met her. We met her when we took our equipment out there and we talked, you know, just kind of casual talk and stuff. And we would see her maybe out of five or ten trips out to the house to practice. We would see her or I would see her two or three times and just it was a hello. There was quite a bit of static electricity in the air when you go out there sometimes. You could feel something was going on, but I've been this my whole life, kind of like the the, uh, the pacifist to stay the way out of trouble unless something somebody was being hurt or something, you know. Dan Clinton was at the Maybelline Manor shortly before the theater opened and witnessed a heated exchange between Danny and his benefactor, Evelyn. Uh, it was a band rehearsal, and Miss Williams came in. She was ranting, raving, and screaming at Danny, and it was bizarre, <laughs> you know. I remember her coming in. I don't think she was drunk, but she was pretty messed up because she was staggering and screaming at Danny and wanted to know what all the noise was and blah, blah, blah. He kind of hustled her off to another part of the house, and then he came back and said, you guys keep going. Evelyn's granddaughter, Sherry, also remembers her grandmother's anger. She could be really cold, and and she could be really wonderful and generous. But if you crossed the line and didn't toe the line the way that she wanted you to, she used her money to control. She could be the best cheerleader building you up. You could do this. I mean, she was honestly just mispositive and would give, would give me checks, you know, to you know cover stuff. She would do everything. And then if I disappointed her, mostly by, as she considers, being disrespectful, yes, the things that she could say were lethal. Her tongue should have been registered as a lethal weapon. Now remember, Danny and Evelyn were living at the Maybelline Manor, with Danny residing in the basement apartment with his boyfriend, a strapping 23-year-old California kid named Steve Wyatt. Steve's job was to assist Evelyn. We found Steve alive and well living in California, and he remembers Evelyn's temper. Yeah, she swore off the handle at me one time, and it was Christmas Eve, and we were all drinking. And I swore off the handle back at her, you know, young drunk punk. What you thought me like that? And went downstairs, and I wouldn't speak to her for like two days, and she was very apologetic. Steve Wyatt remembers Danny King and his storytelling. Danny always had a talent for marketing and was known for his embellishments. Remember, Danny said he was an internationally known Canadian wig maker in Texas and then again in California before he met Evelyn, and his boyfriend Steve Wyatt still remembers some of those wild stories. I know he was in the Navy. He said he was. He had a, a large photograph of himself on the Nautilus. I mean, the photograph was like poster size. It was blown up. But he was also lovers with Mark Spitz. He had all kinds of pictures of him and Mark Spitz together. He was also on tour with Liberace. And according to Steve Wyatt, Evelyn was concerned about money. Evelyn was concerned about too much money being spent and her being told that, well, this is the nature of opening this club. We're going to be having expenses, you know, beyond what we initially calculated. Evelyn and Danny were seen sporting around town and the locals did gossip. But even though Hot Springs is located in Arkansas and in the Bible Belt, the town was much more accepting than most sleepy southern towns. Joe Warren from the Kids Rock Band certainly remembers. I knew there was something kind of odd about the relationship because in my life before, well, not my, not my life before, but in my life I had witnessed, 
young men with older women, and it was like, you know what they were trying to do, you know, and that was about it. But I had a vague idea of what was going on there with him, but I didn't have any details. You know, nobody told me anything. In the lead-up to opening night of the Palace Dinner Theater, there's a flurry of press in the local papers. Conway Twitty was one of the most popular country music acts in the nation, and he was headed to the Palace Dinner Theater in Hot Springs. For $7.50 cover and a $6 minimum, you could enjoy the show, plus buffet dining, valet parking, and dancing on what was billed as the largest dance floor in the city and maybe even the state. Rick Warren was an extremely talented 18-year-old kid who served as the musical director and show producer at the Well, everything on the menu was at least at a dollar higher, and so you covered your six dollars by having dinner. But if you came to the second show, you would want to have to buy maybe two drinks. It always evened out. Across town, the other dinner theater, the historic and storied Vapors, was featuring the Oak Ridge Boys with a dinner show for a $6.75 cover with a $4 drink minimum. The Vapors was truly high-class entertainment. The Vapors was an iconic nightclub offering upscale Las Vegas-style entertainment. It was owned by a fellow named Dame Harris, who also owned a local casino until the governor shut down all the casinos in the late 1960s. The Vapors was notable because Tony Bennett claimed he first sang his signature hit, I Left My Heart in San Francisco, right there at the Vapors. But by the late 1970s, with gambling gone for good, Dane Harris was turning his classy nightclub and casino into a country and western nightclub to fit more with the changing times. I was just eight years old, and I remember the Palace Dinner Theater brought in these huge, large Hollywood spotlights. Their beams of light crisscrossed the night sky, and it was a bit of Hollywood. You could see the beacon of light for miles. Both Danny and Evelyn were excited, according to Angie Sheets, who was one of those kids from the skating rink. I remember, you know, they were opening the theater. They were so excited about Conway Twitty. Yeah, I worked at the hotel, the Holiday Inn, just down the street from the skating rink and he stayed there. Joe Warren, the leader of the rock band Kids, well he remembers seeing Conway Twitty when he arrived at the palace for his opening show. I was there when Conway's bus pulled up. <laughs> I didn't see him play that night but I saw him go to the back of the bus. He was by himself. That's so, so bizarre. You think people like that would have a ton of, of an entourage with them. And he went back to the side of the bus, opened up this little door and pulled out this chicken shit little black Fender amp. It was probably two feet wide and about 18 inches tall. And he got that and his guitar and walked into into the palace to get ready for that night. I didn't speak to him or anything, but I was like flabbergasted. I'm thinking, shit, I got somebody to carry my bass. This guy's going without nobody. (laughs) Danny was glamming it up for opening night. From the probate file, we find three receipts for the purchases of expensive furs from Bensky Furs in Little Rock. Danny's partner, Steve Wyatt, remembers. Danny and I convinced her buy another fur coat, full-length muskrat coat. She bought that for him the day that we were up at the Furriers in Little Rock. We got up to look at kitchen equipment for the kitchen for the club. Rick Warren, the musical director and show producer at the Palace, remembers opening night. She was brought in. She was wearing a gorgeous black uh, sequin pants suit and had this beautiful black sequin hat, kind of like a cowgirl hat. And, of course, Danny was with her. Steve Wyatt also recalls opening night. Oh, opening night was awesome. It was grand. I mean, we had everybody from the lieutenant governor on down show up, and the place was packed. It was pretty amazing to uh, turn that place, that roller rink, into a dinner theater. The new Palace Dinner Theater opened with a bang Wednesday night when a capacity crowd turned out to see and hear Conway Twitty. The new dinner theater has been transformed in a miraculously short time from the former Spa City Roller Palace by Miss Evelyn Williams and Danny King into a plush theater, boasting the largest dance floor in Garland County and possibly in the state. The decor of the new theater features the Maybelline colors of red, black, and gold. Dining is buffet style and dancing between the shows features the big band sounds of Rick Warren and the Palace Orchestra. A number of finishing touches have yet to be done to the new theater, but the capacity crowd turned out. In the rush to open, some of the renovations weren't complete. Rick Warren remembers. 
I have to be honest, it was not complete. It was just too late to try order anything new. So I said it was from a, uh, a sale of used furniture. But they worked around that. One of those finishing touches was pretty important. The kitchen was not complete and could not be used to feed the capacity crowd. The Kilbys prepared the food off-site, and Mary Lou Kilby remembers. We had the Howard Johnson's restaurant. It was during the races, and the Maybelline heiress was working on a building for shows and dinners. The kitchen didn't get finished before Conway Tweedy came to town for his show, so we cooked the food and delivered it to the palace. Conway's manager demanded payment in cash. The fee wasn't negotiated in advance. Danny scrambled to cover the cost by pulling from the opening night's receipts. You know, we might have even paid the headliner that night, might have paid him in cash. Because I don't recall getting a uh, receipt from the bank. I know there was some stuff I had to do at the bank in regards to finishing up the night uh, deposit process. The odd couple of Danny and Evelyn arrived back at the mansion at about 1 a.m. After a nightcap, Danny started doing what Danny always did, letting Evelyn know how important he was to her life and how all this was only possible because of him. Steve Wyatt remembers. It was late when we got back to the house. Of course, we sat up and talked about, you know, what a success it was, how much fun it was, and Evelyn was doing it to have fun. But Evelyn's family tells a different story. Evelyn's granddaughter remembers hearing from her father what had happened that night after the opening. So, uh, you know, Nana had had enough. She had left a message on my father's answering machine telling him that uh, once they arrived back to Maybelline Manor, she and Danny had a nightcap. Danny tried to impress upon her how important he was in her life. How successful everything had been, the opening, everything, his whole involvement was because of him. But, you know, she was done. She knew that she had to sever their relationship. And that's when she asked Danny to move out of the house. Nana told my dad onto the recorder, that which Bill, you know, my father, that she would talk to Danny again the next day after reading the morning paper because she wanted to see the article about the opening night. But my dad told me that He had no idea that it would be the last time he would ever hear his mother's voice. And the timestamp on the message was 3 a.m. Thank goodness that message was left because without it, no one would know that Evelyn had finally had enough and had actually asked him to move out that night. No one knows if Evelyn ever had the chance to read the newspaper's morning write-up of her opening night. But the next 18 hours were the most important hours of her life, and sadly, She wouldn't live to see the next show. Danny recorded his detailed memories in his book, The Maybelline Prince, about what happened the day of the fire. It starts with the staff returning back to the Palace Theater to clean in order to be ready for the show scheduled for later that night. Danny alleged he woke up at 10 a.m. the next morning, and after hearing Evelyn upstairs in the kitchen, he then went upstairs. She was standing in the kitchen wearing slacks and a pullover and oddly her big sunglasses while putting a frozen chicken on to boil for chicken soup. Danny surmised she drank too much the night before and this soup was her version of Jewish penicillin. Yet no alcohol was found in her blood after her death. Danny claimed he was supposed to return to the house around 3 p.m. for the chicken soup. However, he did not arrive until after the fire department had put out the blaze between 5 and 6 p.m. That timeline became really important to our story. She was not an early riser. I mean, if she was up early, she'd make herself a cup of coffee and go back, you know, to her room. She wouldn't have wanted to have been seen less than perfect. She had a little sign on her door like a hotel does that says, do not disturb before noon. I don't think that Nana would have been up, dressed, her wig on, uh, her makeup on. No, not at like 10 o'clock or whatever. Early in the morning, she would be in her kimono and she would wear this fluffy thing on her head because she wouldn't even let you see her hair. So she was like a movie star. You know, she was like an old star and nobody got to see Joan Crawford until she was ready for her close up. Steve Wyatt remembers the day that Evelyn died. Yeah, I would have been in the kitchen with with her and Danny. She complained about so much money being spent, but she did that every day, you know, about how much money was being spent on getting the club done. She was happy because it was pretty much done. That money was going to start coming in. I think she spoke on that level. 
Danny described a chaotic scene when he arrived at the palace. He stepped up on his soapbox and gave a speech worthy of an Academy Award. Danny told the staff they were in show business now, and after his rousing speech, he tells the staff to go home and rest for a couple of hours, but to come back to the palace by 5.30 to prepare for the show. However, Rick Warren doesn't recall Danny King or Steve Wyatt showing back up at the palace on that day. Yet Danny's partner, Steve Wyatt, remembers. I do recall I did drop him off at the club roughly around noon. I just remember getting up late because we'd been up late. He was there with the management team. So Danny King was at the palace briefly for a meeting and then was gone by noon. The devil is in the details. According to Rick Warren, Danny was missing in action. So I was there about 12 o'clock. Was Danny there at the time? No. If he was or had been there, it was before I got there. The next act come in, and I rehearsed her with a smaller group. Kept on in the afternoon, and I think it was around 4.30, I guess, because we had just finished rehearsal. If you like the coroner's report and the programming we're providing, please remember to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so we can keep providing quality programming. Like and subscribe today. Steve Wyatt had errands to run for Danny, and he left the palace with a bag full of cash from the night before. I went to the bank and deposited the money. I know there was some stuff I had to do at the bank in regards to finishing up the night uh, deposit process. And I may have gotten something to eat, like at uh, Wendy's, you know, drive through And then I went to the tailors, to the dry cleaners tailor shop. I believe I had to wait because it was just like a walk-in. It wasn't an appointment. Walk in and then wait for somebody to come and, and take the stitching out and then pin them while they were on me and then do the stitching. And I had to wait till it was done and take them with me. I remember it was after three because I remember I had a level of anxiety because I always like to be prompt with Evelyn and I believe she wanted us back home at three or three thirty, something like that, and we were running late. So I went back to the club and picked him up. And from there we went back to the house. Meanwhile it appears it was business as usual back at the Maybelline Manor. Around three PM when Steve Wyatt was getting his pants hemmed and Danny well, Danny's whereabouts were unknown because even though he says he's at the palace, Rick Warren and others never saw him there. He's in the wind. So in our cast of characters, there are four other people in the house with Evelyn within minutes of when the fire started. Jay Lambert, a 17-year-old kid from Little Rock, had moved to Hot Springs with Danny's promise of playing in the kids' band and living at the manor. This is what he told police in one of his statements. I was at the Maybelline Manor on Brown Drive in Hot Springs, Arkansas. As I was leaving, there was someone in the kitchen. I just assumed that it was Miss Williams, although I didn't see her that entire day. I'd been doing some cleaning around the house. Terry Weatherford, Joe Warren, Nancy Meeker, and Connie Knight came out there just as I was leaving. I left there at 15 minutes to 3, and I arrived at the Palace Dinner Theater at 3 p.m., I didn't see anyone else around the house. I do not know anything about how the fire might have got started. According to Jay's stepmother, he didn't have a vehicle in Hot Springs and depended on fellow band members for rides. He literally left the house at 2.45 and the first police call for the fire came in at 4 p.m. By then, the fire in the house was raging. Steve Wyatt saw no one but Danny and Evelyn at the house that day. I don't recall Steve Jay that day. No, I just remember Danny and I and Evelyn. Jay may have been there, but he was like in separate quarters and he came and went. From that day forward, I lost track of Jay. I don't think I ever spoke with him again. Jay's bandmate, Joe Warren, the leader of the kids' rock band and the owner of Apple Records and his girlfriend, Connie Knight, arrived together. But Joe didn't see Jay at the house prior to the fire. In fact, Joe has vivid memories of what happened when he arrived at the house. We pulled up when the fire was going and they told us what was going on and it was like, holy shit. It was just like, that wasn't real. It just wasn't real. I didn't get it. They had the yellow tape out there. I wasn't even able to get out of my car except walk to around the front of my car. Whoever would talk to me, what's going on? What's going on? You know, I had no idea. I just thought it was a house fire at first. I think I was told about it would pull out, um, but 
I never dreamed it would be her. I just, I, I thought maybe that Danny King and that guy that he was living with downstairs had had a brouhaha, but man, I didn't know. I was speculating. In the chaos of the day, Jay was kind of lost in the crowd. Imagine being a 17-year-old kid just trying to make it in the music industry, and your benefactor dies in a house fire only an hour after you leave the house. Joe Warren recalls why they went to the house that day. You see, the guys in the kids' band, they were really good. And later, they all had success on the regional or national level playing music. So they took their band practice really seriously. In my mind, we were going to do just that. Of course, we never got that far. Would we still rehearse? No, there'd be no reason in it. Wouldn't do us any good to not rehearse without everybody there. Jay died a few years ago, so we'll never know why he left the house. Perhaps he was planning to return by 5 p.m. for band practice. Connie Knight is also deceased, but Nancy Meeker vividly remembers that day. All I remember is taking my friend Terry out to Danny's house that day. We got out of school early because of work release, but I only worked certain days of the week. I think I'm the one that drove out there. Terry didn't have a car, so she usually went with me. It had to be close to time for school to be out. I graduated in 79. I think I got out around 12 or 1 p.m., but I would have gone to get lunch, pick her up, run around before we headed out there for her to meet with Danny. And it seems like we woke Danny up from a nap. I just vaguely remember something about him sleeping. We mainly stood in the carport talking. We might have stepped inside for a minute or two to get a drink of water, but we didn't stay very long. Maybe half an hour? I don't remember Miss Evelyn being home. If she was, I didn't meet her. I had to pick up my mom from work. I think my mom got off at 3.30 or 4 p.m. I really can't remember any more than that, except for seeing headlines the next day that her house had been burned, and I had just been there beforehand. You know, it's really weird that they had my name in the report, and Terry's, but never talked to either of us. A little over an hour after the kids left the house, the first call came into the fire department that something was wrong at the Maybelline Manor. At approximately 4 p.m., the Hot Springs Police Department was notified of an active fire at 212 Brown Drive. It was standard protocol to dispatch a unit to the scene to assist in securing the area and conduct a preliminary investigation. Hot Springs Police Officer Joe Williams drew the assignment that day. The fire was extinguished approximately one hour after the fire department arrived on the scene. Officer Joe Williams with the Hot Springs Police Department was the first officer on the scene. You know, I was out there representing the back of the fire department. Yeah, because we always go with the fire department when you're out on a call, you know. I worked security for her at the day rank. Oh, yeah, so I knew her. She was nice to us. Jim Hawley, the medic that went into the burning house to pull Evelyn out, was quite literally the only person to see where Evelyn was laying in the house during the fire. And Jim comes with an impressive background. Sure, he was a young medic back in 1978, but he eventually ended up becoming a paramedic and firefighter in New York City before going back to get his nursing degree. He's worked in every aspect of nursing and ended up being the director of the ER at a Nashville, Tennessee hospital. He is the consummate professional now, but back then... (laughs) Well, he was just a 22-year-old hotshot medic, eager to make his first grab. Now, remember, it's been 46 years, and his memory is absolutely amazing. We responded to a fire call up by Lake Hamilton. Uh, It was late in the day, I think, between 3, 4 in the afternoon. It was a crisp, sunny day, you know, and as we uh, uh, got in the vicinity of the fire, we can see that it was a uh, working structure fire, meaning that We could see heavy black smoke from, you know, several blocks away. Uh, When we pulled up to the front, uh, we staged our ambulance away from the fire apparatus that was already on scene. And um, we got our first out bags and we went to the front lawn. And the fire department was there and the, the fire was venting itself, meaning it was blowing out the front windows. And the fire department was on the front lawn, lobbing water into the structure. Well, the front door had already been breached. Uh, and it was uh, pushed open, and there was heavy smoke and flame coming 
um, out the windows in the front. And as I approached the front door, the smoke was banked down from the ceiling to about one foot from the floor. And I had a clear view of down this corridor. And I was able to see what appeared to me legs of a, of a, of a person sticking out of a room. And I said to the fireman, I said, you know, I think there's a body in there. And they said, well, it's too hot for us right now. And, um, I just did what I was taught to do. I crawled down the hall, uh, located the the body, uh, grabbed her by her ankles, and I dragged her to the front door. I met my partner. We put her on this folding stretcher, got her out to the front lawn, and she was obviously deceased, blistered, uh, not breathing. Her body was in uh, extremely bad condition. Steve was there that day for two reasons. He had just been elected county coroner, and that was just a part-time job, so he was allowed to continue working as the head of the local ambulance service. He remembers that day, too. Now, remember, I was the baby coroner then. I had just been elected, and I didn't really know peanut butter from crap yet, but I sure did learn things in a hurry over the next few years. I remember that day that I had taken an assistant with me and she took copious notes of everything that happened at the fire scene and what I said. And she remembers distinctly several things, one of which was how many notes she took and also how many photographs I took. And of course, none of those are in the file. We can't find any of those. That's one of the things that is lost forever, I guess. I received a verbal report from the medical examiner's office And I told the newspaper that the medical examiner had advised me that the woman died as a result of asphyxiation or suffocation. She died as a direct result of the fire, I said, pointing out that the soot was found in her lungs. Now remember, this had all come to me from the medical examiner's office. The body, the medical examiner added, had no signs of being beaten or bruised, and the woman's dentures were of the same type as those worn by Mrs. Williams. The identification was made through x-rays obtained from her orthopedic surgeon. Carbon monoxide allegedly was found in the woman's lungs by the medical examiner supporting an earlier theory that she was alive during the fire. You know, you know, during those times, the ambulance medics were all EMTs, and I called them the cowboys because we were on the cutting edge of the newest technologies that had to do with ambulance service and transportation and care of the sick and injured. When I arrived at the scene, I had two main jobs that I was concerned about. Number one is that the medic, Jim Holly, had been overcome by smoke. The other was that I was the coroner and I had to assume immediate possession of the body, which was considered a primary piece of evidence, of course. The coroner's job is to take control of the body and to protect the body and to keep the evidence from being changed. Some things I remember specifically about the scene is uh, the woman appeared to be uh, scalded and not charred. It wasn't like she had been in the direct fire and it appeared to me that she was wearing night clothing that had been burned off. You know, uh, I also remember that uh, I got a call from Tom Ellsworth, who was on the ambulance commission, and he was also the mayor of Hot Springs, and he had already heard about Holly being injured and on the way to the hospital, and he asked me about that, and he also uh, was curious as to why Holly had gone into the fire. And, of course, I can't speak for Holly, but, you know, it's like my old dog, Butter, when he sees a A rabbit or a squirrel, he's gone. And when it comes to a firefighter like Jim Holly was, uh, you know, when you see a body in a fire, you're trained to go in. And Holly uh, went in and grabbed her and pulled her out. And that's what a good firefighter and medic does. Jim Holly vividly remembers what he saw. I also have some thoughts about the skin condition of Miss Williams, the blistering, and that can occur if in a superheated house that is closed, the fire had been burning long enough to superheat the house. The minute you vent the house, which is either the fire took out the front windows or the fire department did, they were lobbing water into the house. And through these very fog nozzles, the water turns to steam and the steam actually will burn anything it comes in contact with. They look more like steam burns than charring and obviously deceased. The skin was very slopping and blistered. But what really haunted Jim and the other firefighters was the position Evelyn was found in. She was found on her back, lying face up. Usually we don't find people lying supine, you know, in an open area like that. Usually they're curled up. They're trying to hide. They're trying to get out. They're near a a point of exit, not just lying face up 
I mean, if she was alive, an autopsy would have proved that she was alive when uh, when the fire started because there would be soot, grime, a large amount of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide in her bloodstream, but I'm not so sure any of that was done. Now remember, I was there, and this is what I remember. Danny's memory is vastly different than mine. Also remember that I was a coroner and that my principal job as the coroner was to protect that body and to transport that body to a facility to keep it preserved as evidence. In Danny's book, he clearly recounts pulling up to the house and seeing the neighbors gathered watching the devastation. The fire by this point was smoldering. According to the fire log at the Hot Springs Fire Department, the fire was called in at about 4 p.m., and the firefighters, once on the scene, fought the blaze for an hour. This means, according to Danny, that he would have arrived at the house sometime after 5 p.m. and most likely closer to 5.30. Danny recalls vividly seeing Evelyn's body lying in the driveway under a white sheet. He claims one of the first responders lifted the sheet covering her body and he looked at her remains. Danny claimed she was charred beyond recognition, but he still recognized her jawline. He claimed a photo of him screaming over her body appeared in the paper the next day. We've been unable to locate any such photo. That just didn't happen. Remember, Evelyn's body was considered to be evidence. Holly remembers specifically, and I do too, the body being placed on a folding stretcher, which is what the protocol would have been. The body was also covered. Remember, this was a crime scene. We protected our crime scene. Steve Wyatt also remembers that day. And then picking Danny up, I forget where he was. He might have been at the club. And we came home and there was like all these fire departments and ambulances and huge crowd of people. And it was like, oh my God, what's going on? And we had to park away from it and walk through. And they had Evelyn's body out on the driveway covered with a sheet. And uh, there was a big hole burned through the roof of the house. Danny and I went up to it, and he pulled the sheet up and looked and threw it down, back down, because she was so burnt. He told me what she looked like, and because we wanted to know, was it Evelyn? And that's when I kind of freaked out, and I was, like, pissed off about everybody being there. It was a total circus. Because here's a Maybelline lady, you know, who was very private, and she was kind of a c- celebrity. Here she was just being disrespected. So from there, Danny and Steve Wyatt leave the scene, wracked with grief and guilt over the unexpected death of their benefactor. But Danny, well, he had a little housekeeping on his mind. The day of the fire, we left that madhouse and went over not far from the house to a young guy's place, and he worked at the roller rink. We went into the lower entrance to the uh, family room, which was like a basement-type room on the lower level. Danny began carrying several checks out of the uh, checkbook, saying he had to get rid of them because he had signed her name to them. I think it was like a panic mode that it could look incriminating, you know, because Evelyn had just been killed. I don't think it was necessarily that, you know, Evelyn would, like, be on him. I know that I recall one discussion about him having signed some checks, and she had kind of overlooked it because she wasn't available for checks that had to be signed because he had the checkbook with him that could be construed as being wrong. In a later interview, Steve Wyatt is much more clear about how Evelyn would have felt about Danny signing her checks. I know that she would not have approved that. She was very adamant about signing her own checks. And I know that she got on to him one time or something about the checks. She was angry with him with that particular checkbook. And it was like a a brown, like a binder, big checks in it. Those signed checks? Apparently, that wasn't something unusual, according to Rick Warren, the music director at the Palace Dinner Theater. He signed her name with him, and he signed her name on the contract. He signed her name better than she did. I'm telling you the truth. In fact, in the police file, there are questions about whether or not Danny signed Evelyn's names on her checks. During questioning by the local police, Danny's attorney, George Callahan, declined when the investigators asked for a handwriting sample. But Danny himself told the police that he had signed Evelyn's name to checks. While we'll never know if Evelyn gave permission, 
it does raise questions. There's no solid timeline. After all, it's been over 45 years ago and memories fade. Add to it, this was a traumatic event. Evelyn supported these men. Not only did they lose a dear friend, but they lost their home and would soon lose their livelihood. I was standing by the office, and uh, Bill uh, walked up to me, and he said, uh, can I talk to you a minute? I said, sure. So we went over to the side. I said, uh, well, what do you think about tonight? Uh, he said, Rick, Evelyn's dead. I said, don't kid me like that. What the hell are you talking about? He said, Evelyn's dead. He said, there's been a bad fire at the house. And I just kind of went in shock. So the decision was made, of course, to close the theater for the night. Back at the palace, the staff had gathered to start preparing for the show that night. Rick Warren remembers. Uh, the concern was, where was Dan? And apparently he had already made his way back to the house when they had already brought Evelyn's body outside. There was no cell phones or anything like that. The staff was supposed to arrive back at the palace at 5.30 to prepare for the 8.30 show. But it's awfully hard to prepare a buffet when you don't have a, well, a kitchen. Mary Lou Kilby from Kilby's Restaurant just down the road remembers. My husband was asked to cook the meal for several hundred, as well as keeping our business going. On the second night when he delivered the food, the staff was standing around and acting strange. The Maybelline mansion had just burned with the Maybelline heiress inside. So the show didn't go on, to say the least. The news of the fire at the Maybelline Manor spread quickly throughout the town, and Bill Robinson, the theater manager at the palace, made the decision to cancel the show that night. Due to the untimely death and the ownership of the palace dinner theater, all activities will be canceled for an 18-hour period, which began at 10 p.m. Thursday. The unknown circumstances surrounding the death brought on the decision by me to close the Palace Dinner Theater for the comfort of all employees and patrons. A search was conducted by the Hot Springs Fire Department officials for any unusual objects because of safety threats. We will be open as usual March 3rd and thereafter. But that wasn't the only news from the Palace Theater that night. This concludes the third episode in the Miss Maybelline, the Pied Piper, and a Clown Named Hobby series. Our team is still looking for answers. If you have information you'd like to share, please reach out to us on our website at coronersreport.net or on any social media platform at The Coroner's Report. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. This case, well, it can still be solved, but we need your help. Thanks goes out to all who made this podcast possible, including Evelyn's granddaughter, Sherry Williams, who sat for hours of interviews and provided the voice to her grandmother's words. We'd also like to thank Norman Jones, Danny Clinton, Steve Wyatt, Rick Warren, Angie Sheets, Joe Warren, Joe Williams, Clint Allen, and Jim Holly for allowing us to share their memories. Special thanks to voice actors J.D. West, Carla Bozeman, Alan Prather, and Doug Crile. Additional information about this story may be found in the following books. The Maybelline Story and the Spirited Family Dynasty Behind It, written by Evelyn's granddaughter, Sherry Williams. And The Maybelline Prince, written by Danae Montague King. <laughs>